This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean and by Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device or your first month of service. Action Show episode 317. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. Are you ready for me to tell folks about the huge show today? Oh, heck yes. All right, well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, we're going to take a look at Cubes OS. It's Linux, but not as we know it. This is our Ooh. third installment of Linux, but not as you know it. We're going to wrap it up this week. With a bang, Cubes OS is an open source operating system designed to provide strong security for desktop computing. Cubes is based on Zen, the X Windows system, and Linux, and it can run most Linux applications and utilize most Linux drivers all within individual containers. You have work VMs, personal VMs, app VMs, and they all work seamlessly together. Even the networking and storage are segmented out into their own VMs. Nice. This thing is like for the Sounds ultra cool. paranoid. It's even won awards for how secure it is. So we're going to deep dive wow. into Cube, Cube's OS and tell you how that works. Don't call it a Linux distribution, no. but you can say it's based on Linux. Now, I apologize in advance. We will probably be calling it a Linux distribution. That's just how we roll. Yeah. Uh, also in the news segment, Red Hat's got a big release. So does Docker. There's some Ooh, Civ yeah. 5 news that I really want to share with Ooh. you guys. And also there's a, a little extra news that uh, HP dropped on us this week. Yeah, they've been known to drop one or two. And mm. some of the headlines are great, and we'll mm. cover some of those. But first, Matt, before all of that... It's our picks. We've also got some feedback we're going to get to. Big show. Big, Big show. So I'll start with the runs Linux this week. I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm on a drone kick these days. Okay. Maybe it's because drones are just exploding. Check this out. Now, I admit, perhaps I am encouraging the robot revolution. Oh, just a little bit. I mean, you may have a I Love Skynet t-shirt in the other room, but whatever. These mini drones mm -hmm. jump, flip, fly, oh, dude, seriously. and climb. <laughs> All running Linux. So these are, it's called the Parrot Drone, and there's also uh, the Jumping Sumo Drone, uh, a Rolling Spider and Jumping Sumo. Sorry, there you go. Ooh. And so that's, look at these now. You see how they both have wheels? Well, the one on the left, those wheels actually come off and it can fly too. Uh, the mini drones run embedded Linux. There hasn't really been much on the processor details, but they're controlled via mobile apps and an open source SDK. Here's an example of oh, I like it. one of the control surfaces. Uh, at first glance, the Jumping Sumo lo looks much like a regular mini-wheeled bot, but as the name suggests, it has some special powers. The Jumping Sumo can leap up to 80 centimeters in height, that's about almost 3 feet, 2.5 feet, and features built-in gyroscopes that help it land on its wheels. So it jumps up high and lands on its wheels. Wild. Uh, this, there's the, uh, they're controlled via Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, up to 50 meters. They have a battery that lasts, mm. both of them don't have great battery life, uh, but you know, about an hour or so you can so, recharge with so a So what you're cable. telling me is I can hook up like a miniature water cannon and use this to wake up teenagers. Yeah, it also has I mean, this a, is perfect. You could record the action as a built-in video camera. Oh, here, I'll, I'll play a little. Uh, <laughs> let's play a little bit of the uh, video. Nice. They have like a little promo here. Nice. Whoa! Oh, dude, I need. Isn't that crazy? I want one now. Look how it jumps! Oh my god! I never get anything done. So uh, he, they, they show it running, if you're listening to the audio version, they show it running through various uh, courses right now, all being controlled from looks like a generic tablet. I mean, this thing is knows no boundaries. Yeah. Whatever obstacle is put in front of it, it's jumping or going under it or and over it And then you, you it. see how it gives a live video feedback to the tablet, too, which is pretty cool. That is. And, and what's interesting about the tablet view is that you're controlling the camera view. So like almost yeah. like you would like an IP camera. It was actually quite compelling. Yeah. All right. So that's the... Uh, that's the jumper. So that you're like, okay, Chris, that's pretty cool, but uh, that doesn't fly. You might be thinking, well, Chris, that you doesn't fly. You need some fly. airborne action. Okay. Maybe you want a quad copter, a copter that goes uh, 90 degrees, 180, or even mm -hmm. 360, forward, backwards, sideways flips. Nice. You can have wheels on it so it can climb walls <laughs> using the propellers. <laughs> oh. Here's pictures of it climbing walls. Uh, oh it can do God. about 11 miles per hour. The wheels pop off, and then it's a quad copter. It can fly for about eight minutes, or it can drive for about six minutes. And uh, here's this, watch this video as this kid just totally trolls his sister with this thing. Yeah, man, after my own heart. Look at that thing. Look at that, that thing. That is awesome. <laughs> Figures it's the sister. It's going to be the one paying the price, right? So uh, he, there he has just in quadcopter mode. He takes off the <laughs> wheels. It flies away. He's controlling it with his smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is so me. And then it flies out the window. And then watch this. I think this will demonstrate the up-the-wall capabilities. How creepy is that? Oh, that's just wrong. <laughs> that would that would, that would would bug me, man. I'd be like, what the hell? 
Oh, wow. Yeah, and then it lands right in his hand right there. That is yeah, she's going to kill him. <laughs> that and then, awesome. of course, it shows that you can take sky selfies because it has a built-in camera, too. That is freaking... That's a, that's awesome. I need I know. One. I, I know. One. I know. It's like, wow. My kids are going to have the coolest toys when they're teenagers because those right there, right. Let's see, I think that I looked at the prices. They're under $200. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Uh, so the Jumping Sumo and the Rolling Spider will launch in August for $160 and $100, respectively. Well, that's reasonable. Linux-powered drones for $160, $100, and you control them over Wi-Fi using your smart I device. I mean, God, when we were growing up, you had the Sears catalog and some robo-robot I do things and go back and forth stuff. I mean, they sucked. You, you know, know, our chat room, man. <laughs> our chat room's like, yeah, I'm going to buy a bunch of these and use them for target practice. <laughs> like, really, chat room? That's what you're going to do? I don't understand. You could like, take those same hundreds of dollars and throw them at the Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just putting it out go. there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or hell, <laughs> just like mount a nice camera on the thing and go get some good shots of, there your, you go. of your property. Yeah. I don't Start know. YouTube channel of trolling people I and you know there's there's a whole scales of drones right there's some bigger ones that can actually you can mount like big old dslr on them and Ooh. really get some great shots but yeah. i just i mean i cannot believe what we're getting to now for under two for 100 200 bones that's crazy well, kind of droning droning world kind of blows my mind and you know eventually they'll all work together over wi-fi to enslave us but you know, when you get all those pictures, you're going to have to have a place to put them, prefer preferably off-site. That's true. Something secure, something you can trust, and something that's an incredible value, like our first sponsor, DigitalOcean. Yes. What is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server, and users can get started in, I mean, about 55 seconds or less if you're a boss like our audience. And here's the great part. Pricing plans start at only $5 a month for Ooh. 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And the best part is DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. And including the New York location, they've got private network networking where you can have droplets communicate over the back end LAN instead of oh, the public nice. internet. That doesn't go against your uh, data transfer either. All that oh, is, see, that's, that's actually really cool. It's a cool. great way to have like some front end web servers and some yes. back end database servers mm -hmm. for an incredible mm -hmm. value. And the other part that I really appreciate is somebody who's very busy is I'm never too busy to actually use the DigitalOcean service because their interface is simple and their control panel is intuitive. And power users can replicate that control panel on a larger scale with their straightforward API. And we've been uh, noticing a big trend in our chat room. Uh, first of all, Michael Dominic on Coda Radio switched his company over, but also a few others in the chat room right now have been telling me you know, there is such a value with the price of uh, $5 flat for a DigitalOcean droplet. And they have pricing structures that just make a lot of sense. They just, you know, notch it up yeah. $10. It, it's really straightforward, $5. Uh, a lot of people are deploying GitLab, an open source cloud, you know, an open source version of GitHub. So it's your own GitLab oh, that's that you run on your own DigitalOcean droplet right. that you have full control over. It's your own private place. And they have a one click deployment. They just updated it. Nice. And the other thing is we're going to be talking about this later in the show today. New version of Docker has come out. DigitalOcean has been at the front of using Docker from the beginning. Some of these application deployments that they do, they do via Docker and Dooku, an open source application framework that they created around Docker. This is something that really stands out to me about DigitalOcean. Is when you go use that dashboard, when you go use these services, it is clear to me that the people working at DigitalOcean build something great and they iterate on it and they make it better and Definitely. better and they think through the product and they don't implement it until it's done. And if something doesn't fit within that vision, and sometimes that's something some of us want, if something doesn't fit within that vision, they stick to their guns and make what they have working perfectly. And until they're ready, then they begin to work on the next phase. And one of the things you can really see where this has been has really bared out is, A, with that private networking that I just talked yes, about a little bit ago, cool. but also just the unbelievable amount of power they've been able to harness through their dashboard without making it this crazy complex system you have to use. And as somebody who has to go back in there on you know very spare amounts of time to make little changes I really, really appreciate that. So go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code last June. That's going to get you a $10 credit. If you get that $5 droplet, you just got it for two months for free. That's what Here, I did. Here's the other crazy thing. DigitalOcean has hourly pricing. Grab that last June promo code, get a $10 credit, and use the hourly pricing. You will be, you will not believe the pricing you can get away with if you just yeah. need to do some testing. DigitalOcean can be a perfect resource for offloading additional scaling, too. If you need to increase capacity quickly, their droplet and imaging system and one-click install make it really easy to do that. And also, of course, they've got Tier 1 bandwidth and data center locations all over the world that are some of the best. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code last June. Get that $10 credit. 
and a really big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Ish. the Linux Action Show. I've been loving it. I've been using it for a lot of off-site uh, duties and, yep. uh, you know, for data and whatnot. I have my, a lot of uh, stuff I kind of want to, you know, a little of my own cloud action. Yeah, my know? chat room right now and my BitTorrent sync all go through a DigitalOcean yep. droplet. And like I've been saying, a lot of people in the in the community have been talking about using it for, for GitLab. And nice. I am all about that because Git's great. Right. Why not run your own GitHub? Why Makes not? Sense. Why you don't need to use GitHub? Just run it on, and it's five dollars a month, and you get some of the, adv- you can take advantage of some of the pro features with that version of GitLab that you have to pay a lot more exactly. to GitHub for. All right, I got That's a desktop it. pick for you because we're all about data integrity Yeesh. here on the Linux Action Show. It's called SnapRaid. What? SnapRaid. Yeah, so SnapRaid Snap is it's a little different. Think of it as uh, checksum and snapshotting on top of any file system you want. Oh. So uh, ButterFS has this. Obviously, ZFS has this. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's also like uh, RAID scrubbing and things like sure. that. One of the things when you have a really, really large data collection is you want to be sure over time that there's not bit rot. You, sometimes there can be hardware uh, I- issues that lead to file system corruption that right. can sit on the drive potentially for years if you don't access those files very frequently. There's programs out there that can go through and hash those files and do checksums against that to verify that Uh, those files are still in the original state that they were when you saved them to disk. Uh, and that's part of what SnapRaid can do. SnapRaid can also take snapshots of the file system, and it can it can recover from up to six disk failures, is what, the way they, wow. they pitch it. Uh, they do automated runtime tests. You can go through and check your file system. It's really nice. And the great thing is, is it sits on top of, like, maybe you want it on top of Extended 3. Yeah, right? or it, that happens. Or maybe, you, maybe you don't want to use ButterFS, or maybe you want something you can control yourself and roll back from yourself. So they say their first design principle was reliability, so they've made a simple architecture. Uh, they have extensive and automated testing that they do on it themselves, which I think is a which is a huge thing. Uh, and I installed it right here, so let me uh, I'll pull it yeah. up for you. you. Can you can pull it down from the Archa user repository, and uh, this is the man page I pulled up because to actually do a snapshot would be a little crazy. Yes, it would. but think of it as a backup program for your entire disk array, and it's it's more targeted for those of us who have very large media collections. Hmm. Uh, it's it's that's who the developers have designed it for right, in mind, right? Uh, because and it's it's more designed for files that don't change frequently, but you still want to make sure are in a good state. Oh, absolutely. So besides the fact that using snapshots, you can recover from disk failures. Other features of SnapRaid are all the data is hashed to ensure data integrity. If the disk fail, if the failed disks are too many to allow recovery, you lose the data only on the failed disk. All the data in the other disk is safe. If you accidentally delete some files, you can recover them using this program. Oh, that's you can start wonderful. with already uh, filled disks. So you can take a snapshot of. So that's an. Oh, that's another great point. Oh, yeah. If you have a like my my uh, my home drive is like almost totally full <laughs> right, right now, yeah. and um, you can't sna- like you. I can't use the ButterFS snapshot feature now because it's too full. Mm. This can save the snapshot to my NFS mount, which I oh. think is really nice. Uh, and of course, you can add disk to this at any time, and it doesn't lock your data in. You can stop using SnapRaid, and you don't have to move to another file system. You don't have to reformat or anything like that. You nice. just turn it off, and it's sort of uh, file system um, agnostic. So if you've got like a, a, a NAS really cool. box sitting on your LAN that uh, you know you just want to make sure that maybe there hasn't been a controller error and right. something's been flipped wrong, run SnapRaid against it. If you've got a RAID zero. In your, I got a couple of RAID zeros because I need the performance, and I'm yeah. always very nervous about the state of that. Oh, yeah. Again, SnapRaid could be taking a snapshot of that RAID zero. It only will it, when it takes a snapshot, it will only back up the deltas, so only the changes. Very nice. So it's nice and efficient. Yeah, and of course, it's free. Sounds like a must have to me. Yeah, and you can go. You can. We'll have a link in the show note. It's snapraid.sourceforge.net, and it's a really easy way to integrate any snapshotting you want across a multitude of systems, uh, a multitude of file systems, and it's one common thing. And I just started playing with it this weekend, so I haven't used it a lot. Oh, I'm going to dive into but that. I that sounds it. awesome. Yeah, I like. I mean, the benefits are just crazy awesome. All right, our yeah. our uh, our our weekly spotlight pick this week came from Halifax, who submitted this to the uh, last subreddit. So thanks, Halifax. I haven't tried it yet because it's really early days, but it's one of those that I want to be able to say, oh yeah, last we covered that. We covered that a year ago. <laughs> totally. We, we might do a fuller episode on this if the project continues to develop. Because get this, speaking of GitHub, Matt, it's called Magpie, hmm. and it's an Evernote replacement using GitHub as a backend for the storage. Oh, nice. And so think of it as. Um, a web tool for managing text files in a Git repo. You can create notebooks, really? which are just folders, create, edit, and delete notes, which are just files, and that's pretty much it. 
However, if you make any of those changes, they're automatically committed via Git. And of course, you get all the features of Git, who made the change, right. change reversals, things like that. That's I could see some benefits for that, especially with collaboration. Now, when I tried this last night, yeah, unfortunately, their demo page is done uh, is down right now. It's early yeah. days for this project. Uh, it uses Markdown and HTML notes. That is really nice. That's uh, helpful. Using Git as the back end obviously makes it easy for backup, track history, things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, you can use the email system to email notes. You can scrape it to PDFs using this Magpie, uh, Magpie uh, program. Pretty neat. Uh, it's That's one that I'm going to watch. Really I don't cool. think it's ready for main usage yet, especially not for something of the task of Evernote, because Evernote's about permanent long-term storage. Right, and so you, right. I don't know if I want to jump in right now, but I'm definitely Yeah, I think it's it. something to kind of play with, maybe kind of throw, you know, throw up on a digital ocean. And, yeah, uh, you know, exactly. Right? right? Yeah. Like, throw GitLab up on yeah. a digital ocean droplet, then throw Magpie on there. And and, and, you, and and the best part is, is, you know, it gives you something to play with. You know, you're not doing anything local. You know, it's all there. Yeah, and, and I, I just think uh, I just think this is so, when you, once you install, there you go. I just think nice. this is such a great great way to do this. There's been other Evernote replacements. Mm -hmm. The thing about putting it in Git is that sort of leaves the back end Sort of, you're exactly. not committed. See, the thing is, when you go to Evernote, right, you are forever committed to Evernote's backend storage. Oh, you're married to it. I right. mean, there's no escaping. Right. But with this, it's GitHub. So uh, theoretically, I could just check out all those text files from GitHub to my hard drive if I ever just wanted to bail right. from Magpie, and and I'm good. And there's some advantages to Git. Yeah, you know, I can see what they're doing there. I think it's something to kind of keep an eye on. And, yeah. and I'd say play with it now. Get familiar with it. I likes it, Matt. I likes mm -hmm. it a lot. All right. Well, one last little mention before we run. Uh, go check out episode two of How to Linux just came out this week. Do -do -do. Yes. And this is uh, three Linux complaints solved. So Chase has been running Linux for a couple of weeks, and he came to me. He's like, okay, these three, I'm like, give me your top three things that are bugging you. So these, these, this, and this. And then we threw in one bonus, too. It's funny, you know, have you ever noticed that when you switch folks over to Linux, like, they almost refuse to believe that you don't need antivirus? Oh, yeah. Well, it, does, it, it doesn't compute. I mean, right. it's like, it's like but it mean? executes yeah. code. And yeah. then, of course, you're like, well, does Linux have viruses? And then you kind of go, well, no, but, you know, right. and yeah, it becomes yeah. like a thing. And then they're like, but you said, but. So yeah. uh, I threw in a bonus like, all right, Chase, yeah. if you get nervous, this is Clam Antivirus. This is how you right. update it. And this is how you scan files. So exactly. we solved three of his problems and showed him how to use Clam Antivirus. Mm -hmm. And that is in episode two of How Ish. To Linux. And what we're doing with this is we're getting Chase down with the fundamentals of using Linux for the first few episodes yep. of How To Linux. And then we're going to branch out into projects and we're going to bring in community members. Matt's going to come Ish. in. We're going to have all, all kinds of stuff come into the show. Uh, but for the first bit... Uh, we're uh, just sort of getting him on his feet. Next week, we're going to travel to Pogo Linux and do an interview with them on some of the new products they're working on for mm -hmm. enterprise customers. So that'll be in. Very we thought cool. Chase has been really, you know, heads down in the desktop space. And I want to remind him that, you know, there is this whole enterprise business server aspect to Linux. Sure. So that'll be in episode three of How to Linux uh, nice. next week's episode. Cool. All right, Matt, let's do the news. <laughs> Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Matt Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting is my mobile service provider, and Bam! Matt's mobile service provider. <laughs> nice, Matt. You're rocking the ne the Note too, and I've got right. the Nexus Five over here. And uh, you know what? One of the great things about being on the Ting network is they don't get in the way of updates. I've mm -hmm. already got the app. There was an update that was pushed out recently. I was rocking it on my uh, Nexus Five already. I posted to G Plus like score, score. So what is Ting? Well, yes. my friends, it's mobile that makes sense because there's no contract and there's no early termination fee. Mm -hmm. Well, because there's no contract. That's right. So simple, simple. Here's Here's the best part, Matt. This is like what I really love about Ting is you only pay for what you use. This is a clever system because a lot of times carriers try to get you to pay into something that's extra just so that way you don't go over. That way right. they can get you to whole, get a whole bunch of money out of you that you might not actually need to pay. So Ting flips that around. They bill you based on just what you use. They take your min your megabytes, your minutes, and your messages, and they add that all up at the end of the month. Whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you pay. My average Ting bill is around $30 per month, $33 per month. That's for two smartphones, an HTC One mm -hmm. and a Nexus 5. And then every plan includes hotspot and tethering. You get whatever text messages you want to use, you just use them. It's really straightforward, and it makes a lot of sense. It's $6 a month plus taxes, whatever the man needs to take. Uh, and if you go over to last.ting.com, go to last.ting.com, they'll take $25 off your first device. Land there on that page and try that savings calculator. You might be surprised. So plug in not what, you, what you're paying for, but actually what you use, and then see the difference. Yeah. Usually it's well over $1,000. Yeah, usually just actually grab your old bill. Look Look at the actual usage and plug that in. It, it, it'll blow your mind. It just It's unbelievable. Now, Matt, it is Father's Day. Yes, it is. And uh, I thought uh, Kyra's got a great app pick for us that has cool. sort of a Father's Day theme with it. So why don't we uh, play Kyra's app pick of the week for all us fathers out there? Looking for a private content hub for you and your partner? I'm Kyra, and this is Ting's App of the Week. Yeah! Oh! Okay. Connects you with the love of your it's life to help day. you share those special moments privately. 
You can send text messages, videos, photos, and more for an intimate messaging experience. The app displays a private timeline for you and your partner. You can directly text each other inside this thread, send all types of media, draw together, and much more. Need to meet up but not sure of your exact address? Tap your partner's name and choose the navigation icon to instantly share your location. This feature, called Live Beacon, broadcasts your live coordinates for 30 minutes, which is great, for example, if you're out shopping and want to meet up with your significant other, but aren't exactly sure where you'll be. The photos you send can be hidden inside the app oh, or sent nice. as a Snapchat-esque photo using the self-destruct feature. Nice. Woo. Oh. Hitting the top left oh, message like icon will open the navigation hey, it's Matt. bar. That's his Matt. you share calendar reminders, Is she... grocery lists, past moments, oh, and more. Boy. The setup yeah, the bag. lets you create the ever important security code, <laughs> along with some cool app features like music status sharing and city yeah. sharing. Whether you're making it work long distance or currently living together, Couple has the features for all types of relationships. The app is currently available on Google Play or the App Store, and you can get it for free today. Thanks for watching, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Yeah, buddy. You can also find them on Twitter, Twitter doc, or twitter.com slash tingftw. And uh, check out help.ting.com. They've got an awesome community over there. Folks are already trying out things like the Olifone, Firefox OS, and uh, all kinds of really interesting experiments. Yes. Ting does not shy away from any of that stuff. No. They're, they're really open to all that because they're mobile enthusiasts themselves. That's why they have no-hold customer service support. If you call them at one 855 Ting FTW anytime between 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. Eastern Time. A real Canadian answers the phone, and that Canadian has the power to solve your problems. That's right. And they will take good care of you. Last.ting.com, and a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action That's Show. That's right. Okay, man, we got to start big this week. The big, big announcement is Red Hat Enterprise hey. 7 has hit. This, Holy cow. This is a, this, you know, these this big, pretty big. These big Red Hat uh, releases are like sort of like a moment in the uh, Linux industry, if mm -hmm. you will, Matt. And the thing that uh, uh, Red Hat is really particularly pushing for this release is really, really good Docker integration. Good, uh, good. Red Hat's That's platform important. business pres uh, vice president, Jim Totten. Jim Totten. Totten, Totten, yeah. Hmm. Uh, he said that Red Hat developed a close partnership with Docker, mm -hmm. and Docker just released 1.0. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, and as for the features, Red Hat Enterprise Linux says they have a lot of stability and performance improvements. Depending on the workload, Red Hat's claiming 11 to 25% faster uh, versions of like uh, processing things wow. like that pre than previous That's ones. That's noticeable. The, 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 uh, the big thing that really jumped out at me, this is really two. Uh, first one was they switched to SystemD in this release. Mm -hmm. Second one... So they switched to XFS as the default file system. Not Butter, not Extended 4. choice. Yeah, XFS. Did not see that coming. And uh, I think uh, it was uh, Groove and Chicken, or Groove Chicken, Groove in Chicken. the uh, last subreddit who said, you know you're a, a nerd when the most interesting news of the week is about a file system. He says, I know there was discussion about Red Hat Enterprise Linux and its use of ZFS, and he kind of want to know what people thought about it. And so uh, I've had a little ZFS hmm. Uh, experience in oh, the yeah? past, we had a uh, a large at the time. It was sixty gigabytes, which back then was was, was huge, very, very large, and it eventually got to a terabyte, which was unbelievably large. Uh, I mean, when we got to a terabyte, that was a really really big deal, and we actually ran XFS on that um, attached to a SUSE Enterprise Linux box because it was really the only way to get what's called extended attributes back in the day. Ah, where we had a bunch rough. of Windows okay. users and, and we had a bunch of Windows admins and they wanted mm -hmm. to be able to right-click on a folder, go to properties, and set NTFS-style security permissions where right. multiple groups and users could have access to yeah. files. And the only file system at the time was XFS. And I was a little nervous. There weren't a lot of choices, though, and mm -hmm. we deployed eventually, which grew to, grew to a terabyte, running XFS, and it ran, it ran. I mean, it flawlessly. We also tried Riser FS uh, later on and things like that, but we eventually stuck with XFS. Yeah, I've had some uh, Riser. Oh boy, that takes me back. I've I've had mi mixed successes with that. You know. Yeah. Depends yeah. You got to watch your wives when you're using. Got to watch your. Uh, yeah. Hey, yeah, oh, uh, hey, I was, gonna, I was gonna walk around that one. Uh, <laughs> XFS has recently had some uh, changes applied yeah. to it too, so it's still under development, but it's been around for a long, long time, and that's you know ButterFS. Is got got a lot of features that I like a lot. I'm running it here and I'm running it on my servers here. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't, I don't, I, I, I am not surprised at all that Red Hat opted not to go with ButterFS yeah, for their Yeah, they're kind files. of playing it safe. I mean, maybe some might even argue overly cautious. But again, this is an enterprise situation, and they're t they're taking it super safe. Something, so, something yeah. else, and I'm, I I didn't grab the names of it because I just I just noticed it in passing as interesting. Mm -hmm. You remember a couple of weeks ago when uh, the SUSE guys tried to make a big deal about their new K-Splice uh, kernel live patching? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah. Uh, well, Red Hat has introduced their own version with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 that's sort of, mm. that sort of competes with that. It's like... 
like the Red Hat version of doing live kernel patching without having to reboot, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of a me too, but it's you know it's good they're doing. Yeah, it. I, I think they've been. I think they were in development before SUSE dropped theirs, and perhaps ah. that's why SUSE made such a big splash about I it because they knew probably. one from Red Hat was coming. Uh, I'm not seeing the name now, but it's it's all K Splice and K Patch or something mm-hmm. that all sound the same. Uh, and it's just it, it is an interesting thing where you have something that needs to happen on the server. Uh, you know, apply something to a running kernel right. and. To the two major server enterprise distros are taking their own approach with it. They're not really standardized, even though they're both releasing them as open source mm-hmm. and you know pushing them to the community and trying to get people excited about them. They're not using each other's code. So for Joe Average, uh, trying to interpret what the heck this does. So like you got a running kernel. You it's obviously on a machine. It's running at the time, and you're needing to apply XYZ. like a driver maybe. Apply or, a driver. Yeah. Okay, example or a file system. So support. what what does this do? This applies it, and then you don't have to reboot. Right. Is yeah. that is that your sweet sauce? Yeah, it's like okay. patching only without having to rebuild. That's uh, that's kind of nice. Um, and this all goes together with Docker 1.0. Docker 1.0 was released at DockerCon this week. Uh, check this out. After 15 months, 8,741 commits from more wow. than 460 contributors, 2.75 million downloads, and over 14,000 Dockerized apps, and feedback, of course, from tens of thousands of users about Docker, they have released Docker nice. 1.0. It's a Woo. milestone. There it's it a is. big release. It's a big deal. We talked about Docker a while ago, yes. And uh, I, I think pretty much what we predicted in that episode that it was going to be a, a, a huge change for the server space. Oh, I think, I think so. that's playing out here. And one of the things they're talking at DockerCon now is building a way to distribute applications in a Docker environment mm. through this thing they're calling the Docker Hub, and they're going to allow software partners to work with Docker to say, "All right, well, I'll, here we'll just use like um." I don't know, for whatever reason, Firefox. We'll sure, just say yeah. Firefox. Firefox will make a Docker container, okay. and they'll push it up to the Docker uh, hub, and then users will be able to download this official Docker image from the, the That's the Firefox, been blessed, essentially. Right, right. that the okay. Firefox guys are publishing themselves. And what let, that lets them do is they'll say, well, we'll make sure that Firefox works inside this Docker container. Everything we expect, we all the libraries we expect, mm-hmm. everything on the file systems where we expect, this is our own little bubble of Firefox's runtime environment, okay. and we package all of this up, and we pick it up, and then it sits down on top of another Linux box, connects to its kernel uh, connections, you know, its APIs, mm-hmm. boom, and now it's all running just like the Firefox dev had it running on his machine. Wow. And that's what's really compelling for them, and there's oh, ways for them yeah, to make money there and, and stuff like that. And when you think about distributing large enterprise applications, like enterprise vendors, for a long time would say, well, our application only works on Red Hat Enterprise 5, right. and uh, you have to have a support contract to make sure it runs. Inter- well, right. now if you can say it works in Docker. Yeah, just take this. You can have it on, it on. You don't yeah, care. You can have it on a Gen two box. You know, whatever, whatever has Docker support. And Bob's your uncle. It's just going to run. And they're they they obviously have recognized that. And they're going after this in a big way too, because it's not just Linux too. They're going to allow you to create Docker containers on a Linux box, pick it up, and nice. drop it on a Mac, and run it on Mac too. So it's really going to go cross platform. It's a huge deal, too, and it, it, I think it's going to take mm. a lot of people who are using virtualization. They're going to pivot from using virtualization. They're going to use these Docker containers, and it's such a it's such an awesome technology. Oh, so, definitely. I think it's a real game changer because it, it really uh, evolves how resources are used in general. I mean, yeah, it really and, makes it, you rethink and it makes stuff. it easier for sysadmins. It makes it yes. easier for developers, and it helps normalize out the Linux ecosystem, It's too. just less crap to deal with, right? I mean, uh, way to go, guys, on Good. 1.0. That's, we've been I following that project for a while, and I think I still have it on this laptop. I think I think I had like I think I have like an Ubuntu 1204 Docker container oh, yeah. on this Archbox. So if I ever need an Ubuntu works, you know, an Ubuntu uh, user space, I just mm-hmm. go in there and boom. Yep. All right. So did you see this 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 wide range of coverage of HP's big announcement this oh, week? Oh yeah, it's all over the place. It, HP stabs Microsoft in the back. Yeah, l- lots of the adjectives and descriptives. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what is really going on. Uh, HP has announced something that they're calling right now the machine uh, because they literally admitted they can't come up with a better name. Uh, <laughs> that's really what respect, they said. Respect. Uh, yeah, respect. I know. Uh, I respect that. Uh, yeah. And check this out. According to Bloomberg, up to 75% of HP's R&D division, which is sort of world-renowned, yeah. is working on the machine right now. So this is HP is all in on this wow. project. It's going to be running Linux, and I'm going to just play a little bit from their keynote. It's a little dry, but it's listen to what they're saying because what they're talking about is rethinking the way uh, a computer is built uh, because right now what they argue is that the, the, the architecture of computers where you have you know a PCI bus mm-hmm. and a processor and a memory uh, and, and and they're all separate from each other is does not provide the amount of bandwidth and throughput we need to manipulate what they call big data you know like the stuff the NSA tracks and stuff like oh, that. oh yeah well, so cater to those guys yeah here's a little description. So let me introduce you 
to what the machine is. And then we'll go into a little bit of detail. Okay. Sure. So the machine actually rethinks computing because we're going to now take specialized processors. We're going to specialize the compute to the actual workload that we're running. Hmm. And I'll actually connect that to some of the work that we're doing today. So I'll pause right there. So think about that. What that what, so I think when he says that, and I could be getting this wrong, but I think of like ASIC processors, how you have Bitcoin mining on GPUs. And then right. when we built ASIC processors that were task specific for Bitcoin mining, the, 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 the power behind that just exponentially increased, right? So when you have a CPU that is specifically built for a purpose, it does one of two things. One, it obviously makes it very fast yes. at that thing, but it also makes it very um, workload specific. And I wonder if it would make it a little more disposable because once you're perhaps done with that project or that particular task, what do you do with the computer? So I'm this curious too. how specific these CPUs would be. But they're talking about you know dedicating at least some of the processors in the machine to the specific task. But the other thing that we're doing is we're going to connect that to a large single pool of what we call universal memory. And again, we'll give you a little bit more details on that. And then we're basically going to just connect those two with a very high speed, low latency fabric based on photonics light. where we use light for hmm. communications. This will enable us to deal with massive, massive data sets. Ah. But not just be able to take those massive data sets, but ingest them, store them, and then manipulate them and do this at orders of magnitude less energy per bid or per compute. And of course, uh, I wonder if I don't know if he mentions it. He might give it a quick mention. So with that summary of the machine, let's start going into a little bit of detail. So the first thing is you can actually see on the screen. Well, I'll, 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 so obviously, um, and they kind of dug on Microsoft a little bit. They said their uh, HP said during this presentation that they're a little disappointed in the pace of operating system development. Uh, so they said, we, as part of the machine, are announcing the intent to build a new operating system, all open source from the ground up, optimized for non-volatile memory systems. Uh, they say, we also have a team that's starting from a Linux environment and stripping out all of the bits we don't need, so that way you maintain compatibility for apps. And I don't know what the uh, hell that means other I'm than not sure either, but we strip everything out so it only works on HP hardware. Personally, perhaps. I'm pretty convinced it runs on Lorelon technology, but that's just me. And they also have a team working on Android to work on this thing. But the one person and company not mentioned was Microsoft. They, they, uh, they uh, Even though EHP has been a huge Microsoft partner for so yeah. long, uh, that and that is why you're getting all of these headlines. I, I pulled a couple of my my favorite headlines, Matt. Are you, are you, let's see. Are you, let's see. Are you ready for a little headline, yeah, headline bingo? HP stabs Microsoft in the back, dumps Windows, prepares Linux-based operating system. That was Softpedia. Yeah. Uh, like here's it. the Tech Republic. HP's the machine kicks Microsoft to the curb in favor of Linux. Ooh. And then here's HP plans to destroy Windows from Business Insider. Now this is a oh, Business Insider definitely nailed it there. I think that they kind of they always got the headlines that kind of. I know, right? And this what this is is this is a specific machine for a specific type of workload running a specific operating system. This is not HP bailing on the Linux or I mean on the Windows desktop. This is not HP saying they're no longer going to sell x86 PCs. No, they're they're going Windows. specialty with this, and they're yeah. definitely targeting uh, those that need to process large amounts of data, uh, probably three letter data. But uh, you know who knows. So. Uh, HP's been working on this machine for two years. Uh, we don't really know much on the exact details. It seems that the machine is predicated on the idea that current RAM storage and interconnect technologies can't keep up. Would make sense you'd need a custom OS for a system that's this customized. I don't see this as HP uh, giving Microsoft the finger. No. I just see this as HP branching out and trying to solve a problem that needs to be solved for a large enterprise customer, and Windows just is inappropriate for that workload. Like, we will be finding over the next few years that it's inappropriate for many workloads that become more and more specialized. Exactly. As you get more specialized processors, as you get more specialized work tasks, as you get these big data sets, your Windows is no longer going to make a lot of sense. Well, and you need something that's nimble. That see, the way it works right now is if if Mark's, let's say HP wants to do something like this, for example, and uh, Microsoft's like, oh yeah, we want to totally be part of that. They're two separate companies with two separate work teams and two separate goals, trying to make those two things mesh and work together. That's kind of a pain in the butt. Right. However, you throw Microsoft to the curb and you do a Linux approach, you can actually have an internal team in your own company do the same thing. 
that's a very compelling yeah. argument, especially when you get into photons and Power Rangers and all this I know. stuff, right? Like, at, at the end of the day, <laughs> what I'm most excited about is to see HP actually do some real good R&D, and, yeah. and let's see something really? new, because we have had the same approach to PCs now mm -hmm. for a long time. Maybe they can come in there and show us a better way to do things. Exactly. And, you know, HP has been an industry leader in the past. Let's lead again. Definitely. We're well, ready. you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I am skeptical, you know, as always. Well, when, it comes when they to got HP. into light and photonics, that's like, oh, wow, hey, something compelling. Now you have my interest. That's, I that's wonder, pretty cool. Hey, Matt, do you think we'll have a web OS version? Uh, oh, that would be cool. With <laughs> photons and Power Rangers? I certainly hope so. <laughs> All right. Voltron. Speaking, speaking of photons and Power Rangers, uh, Civ 5 came out this week for Linux. Huge game Huge. release. And uh, the folks behind it are what caught my attention. Aspire, I think is how you say it, because I believe when I've heard uh, the intro sure. goes, Aspire. I think is what it says. That's when you what play it looks like to me. Uh, and here's why this is interesting to me: is Aspire uh, just we just watched the Witcher port go horribly mm -hmm. bad for the developers, oh, horrible PR. Uh, on the Aspire, it's completely different end of the spectrum. So there was a community forum started thanking them for doing a proper port to Linux. Yes, which and is the, cool. And the Aspire devs noticed, they, and they wrote a thread just to thank us for the port with comments. We're floored, you guys. Is there a smiley face with tears in it? We honestly had no idea we'd get this type of response. Uh, and we can't thank you enough for the support. Keep this up, and I can promise you, you'll be seeing more AAA Linux work from Aspire in the future. Wow. Hey, that's really cool. Now, here is what's really good about getting in good with Aspire. First of all, they used uh, SDL2, which means you're going to have multi-monitor nice. support and things like that, which makes which makes a lot. Uh, it just makes it for a much better gaming experience on the mm -hmm. Linux desktop. So they obviously had a little bit better idea of what they were doing when they jumped in. They also commented a little bit on their relationship with Valve. And this is good for us Linux users who want to support developers moving games over to Linux. It really counts what platform you buy the game under. And then what platform you play it under. So if you buy it, like for me, I probably bought Civ Five before it was available for Linux. I don't sure. know what I don't know if I bought it through the web or what. Um, I, so whatever OS I did buy it under, that's yeah. what it registered as. Right, exactly. It will stay that way forever until you play it for like a week or two under Linux. And really? then it switches over. Oh, that's kind of wild. Unless you buy it under Linux from the beginning. Huh. That's when Aspire gets a cut. That's when it registers as a, as a Linux sale for them. Uh, the other reason why I'm really kind of excited about this good response is... Um, Mm. Aspire is, this is what they do. And right. they port these games to other platforms, and they've been doing this for the Mac for, I think, more than 10 years. So they got some experience in those departments. Yes, okay. and okay. so these are people that know how to move AAA title games over to other platforms, and they've just done one for Linux, and it went off swimmingly. The response to Civ has been great. Now, it's not totally, it's not a, and they even admit they don't consider it a total complete port because sometimes there's day of DLC that might not work immediately on oh, the sure. version yet. Okay. So they're still working on that. But the, the fact that it's gone this smooth already is a really good sign for future ports. Asp the only thing about Aspire is usually their ports come well after the game's been released. They generally engage with the developer after like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the most like, um, I don't know, I want to call it the most expensive time, but you know right. when a game's really at the top? Oh, and it's sort yeah, of like, yeah. It, you know, they kind of, that, the that, peak period's kind yeah, of died that, off. That sure. period sort of fades, and then Aspire seems to engage with them and then move the title over, but really good first. Uh, after the after the train wreck of The Witcher 2, this has yeah. been a complete 180, and it's going great. A good developer engaging with the community, good community response, a good port, and a great game, and it's okay. on sale. At least I think it's on sale. If it won't, it will be again soon, because the Steam sale is coming up towards the end of June. Oh my god, tell me about Huge it. Huge sale. So, Huge. awesome news. Go check out Civ 5 if you haven't grabbed it yet. I downloaded it, but I haven't jumped in you know it's like one of those right. things where i think it's like it's one of those games where i think you could probably spend your whole day i playing. think so too and i like the fact that they looked at the underlying technology and said okay look the, you know we want to make sure to do this properly and it seems like they really addressed that and that's good and know? uh ebear in the chat room says all the dlc that he's gotten seems to be working just fine so far uh, i haven't tried any of it so i don't okay. know uh but i i think i'm i don't know i mean i'm pretty happy i was a little worried when the witcher was like oh man are we gonna start uh, to see a whole bunch of crap ports and then boom next week Civ five and it's awesome they they've set a new tone. I launched uh, it. That's awesome. I launched it and it plays well. I like I, I like spent like fifteen minutes mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, I can't start this right now, but it works. It's here. Nice. It's like the moment. So very We've cool. We've arrived. All right, Matt. That's all the news for this week. <laughs> talk about Cubes OS. It's Linux, but not as you know it, and it's a pretty compelling setup to really keep you secure. But first, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76, creators Ooh. of machines born to run Linux. Man, these guys, you know, it's funny. On our pre-show today, we've been talking a lot about fighting with computers, and right. I, I read like I read stuff like, oh, I did an update and my Wi-Fi broke, or this and that, and I just think... Why are people still not just switching to System76? Stop fighting exactly. with all that silly little stuff and just use your computer. 
That's it. And they have great laptops. They have great desktops. In fact, <clears throat> I'm using right here one of their laptops, but I don't think we give enough attention to the desktops. Built right here in the good old Both US of Both of my desktops that still run flawlessly mm -hmm. are from System76. Mm -hmm. so. I think the I think the Rattel performance is the sleeper mm -hmm. hit right yes, here. And is. then when you really want to get a serious work done, you've got the Leopard Extreme. And then also the Sable Complete is such a great family computer. Oh, if you especially if you're liking the video editing or anything real intense, the, the you that know screen. that liquid cooled goodness. Mm. But then you got the sable for like you know it's like you want something aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, you just boop. Yeah, this would look good in the office too. Yes. Uh, so go to System76. Get yourself a computer that's meant to run Linux. Something that you're not constantly fighting. Like maybe the that's Bonobo. Right. I love the Bonobo. I love the Bonobo. So much uh, power. There's also the Ultra Pro, which is a great machine. And you know there's they have a whole range of systems you can check out over at System76. Mm -hmm. That once you get them. <clears throat> You just get to play with your Linux. System76.com, right. and a big thanks for their support of this segment of the Linux Action Show. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about Cubes OS, man. Cubes. Uh, we've we've been we've been mentioning it here and there throughout the whole OS or mm -hmm. throughout the whole show. It's definitely an interesting what they're calling a full OS, right. not just a Linux distribution. Uh, and uh, it's it's kind of still early. They've mm -hmm. uh, they've released a couple of releases right now. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat, Well, man. and I think it's an interesting distinguishable point that you say it's a full operating system versus just like just pointing a distro. to it and saying it's a distro of yeah. Linux. It's actually an operating system. It sounds almost like BSD-like. So Cubes you know? 1 <clears throat> was released in September of 2012. Okay. Cubes Release 2 almost uh, is almost complete. RC1 shipped in April, uh, and then on February 16th, 2014 of this year, Cubes was selected as a finalist of the Access Innovation Prize in 2014 for the Endpoint Security Solution. So here's 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 a breakdown of how Cubes works, and I've got a little graphical illustration okay, here. Okay, that'll help me. This is the architecture. It's based on Zen, the X window systems, and then it all runs on top of Linux. Most applications all work. Uh, Cubes utilizes virtualization in order to isolate various programs from each other and even sandbox them uh, to many many sandboxes many system level components like networking and storage subsystems. So if you're looking at this diagram. Ah. You see how that's the network. Network layer? domain's got its own deal. Yeah, and that's okay. and they're using communication in the back end. So when when something like this web browser I'm using right here to get out to the web needs communication, it communicates through that network domain because obviously that's your highest attack surface right, right there remotely. Exactly. So if you isolate all of the networking functionality into its own separate VM, that's I incredibly like that. secure. And then they do the same thing with storage. And then they do the same thing with the GUI. The UI that we're looking at right now is actually its own isolated system. It's the DOM zero administration domain. And the apps VM and I mean I don't really like that. So here's you know? my cubes. OS VM manager. Okay. And you can see right now I've got a few VMs running. I've got my my, my main uh, sure. desktop here. That's DOM0. I've got the net VM, obviously, to get network access. Mm. I've got the firewall VM. It has its own separate firewall VM. And then I have the personal VM. These okay. are all Fedora 20 based. The personal VM is where I'm running Firefox from. Okay. Okay. We're going to get into that in a little more detail here in a little bit. But so you're kind of getting some of the basics by looking at this. You have a work VM, a personal VM, which is the one I'm running out of right now. Random VM. There's disposable VMs. That's kind of nice. Maybe yeah. you have an app you're just testing. You don't necessarily want to uh, live in it forever. And it's everything is everything is erased when you run it. So after you're done and you close it, it's uh, it, nothing is nothing is safe. Right. So here's here's how Cubes kind of makes this manageable. Is uh, they have it's all based on a template system. Okay. So when when like uh, here's my various VMs that came pre-installed. I have a banking, personal, untrusted, wow. work. And if I run, for example, I'll run, uh, here's my banking VM, okay? I'll run uh, Firefox from the banking VM. And you'll see it starts up a VM right here. And it and gives you a nice alert. In the corner. And it does take a little bit longer than just launching the application because sure. you are, it is, if, it is creating a, a VM for you from a uh, template VM, a Fedora 20, and then, okay. and then starting that virtual environment. So now we'll go into the untrusted one, and I'll launch Firefox from my untrusted. So this is doing stuff where maybe I'm right. researching malware or something like that. Okay. What's cool is you now see in the background the untrusted VM starts up. Mm -hmm. It goes off that Fedora 20 template. And you notice right away how the border on this one is red and the border yeah, on this I one is green. Yeah, I noticed that. And, and I wonder if they're reflective of the padlocks that are showing up. They are exactly. They match okay. the same colors of the VMs in the VM manager. So you can look at just the title bars. And I know this is in my banking VM. And I know this is my untrusted. And it also says it up here in the title bar, of course. But and you notice though I'm switching between them seamlessly. Yeah. Now it's not totally flawlessly. Like if I wa if I write Linux right here, right. and you know normally under X you could highlight something and then use your middle click to paste it. If I go over here and I close this, I can't paste it. Oh, okay. However, 
I think this one worked most of the time. If I copy it, there is they're offering with part of their framework. No, it didn't work. They're offering with their part of the framework to enable secure copy and paste between VMs. It doesn't. I don't know if I have to turn that on well, separately. It doesn't work for me. And what's but an interesting point to that though is that if you're worried about avoiding uh, executing random code, right? That you're like and you're researching malware, researching right. you know, random uh, executions. So I was like, oh yeah, and you copy and paste. You don't necessarily want that to happen. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. So what I like yeah. about this a lot is what this template system lets you do is you go into one spot and you update the template. So see, they have in they have here in the menu template Fedora 20, and then here's software update. And if I run this, this is this will run Yum on the template VM that all these other ones are spawned from ah. at creation. So there's only one place I have to go to patch all of my virtual machines. That I like. Right? Less crap, less headache, less right. everything. Sure. And, and then when they're done, there is a persistent storage area that these VMs can use, but when they're done, they destroy the entire system. So you wow. don't have like... You know, in my case, uh, one, two, three, four. Five. I don't have six huge ass VMs sitting around right. all the time that you have to deal with or decide what right. to do with. It does sure. take more space because, like, I, my net VM is always running and stuff like that. But again, yeah. because it's snapshotting from this read-only template, it, it is much more. Uh, it, it just saves a ton of space. I, I think it's such a neat way to do it. It's a good system. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little more about it. Uh, they they consider it security by isolation. Obviously, utilizing the virtualization technology, various programs can t uh, communicate with each other. Many of the system level components have been sandboxed as well, which is pretty neat. And uh, here you can see this is the VM manager. Uh, let me close uh, Firefox yep. right here. So you can see these are all the VMs I have running. As I close applications, the VMs do eventually shut down too. So they're not all, they don't stay running all the time. Well, and it doesn't seem like there's that much of a time delay. It seems like it's fairly responsive. And I'm actually curious as to what it uses in terms of resources. Like what kind of machine do you it, need to run? It does take more memory. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm running this on a System76 Gazelle. And I, I, thankfully I have plenty, I have like, I think eight gigs of RAM. Oh, okay, so SSD. you've got a comfortable system. To but do it's, it. not, it's, not, it's not outrageous. No, it's not like you're running it with 64. I mean, it's like eight gigs is pretty standard these days. I mean, really. I mean, so that's, you ha that's pretty reasonable. You have also uh, some documents and applications that can run, like I mm -hmm. mentioned, in these disposable containers. So if we go into um, uh, disposable VM, here's okay. my disposable VM Firefox. And, uh, oh, okay, this is a little interesting thing. So this is the first time I've ran Firefox in mm -hmm. the disposable VM since I updated the template. So it'll go ah. through, and all the stuff that's unique to this VM, it now goes through and does all the updates. It applies all of them. Very helpful. This happens once after an update. And, you know, it's about every time you have a big Fedora update. So I just did one large update, and now I sure. have to update this. What's neat about this is anything I do to this this system, if I if I, if I I muck up Firefox, if I install right. a whole bunch of extensions. Corrupted profile. If I, you know, if I, if I go on a porn binge and I just load right. my system up with all kinds of dirty things in my history, when I close <laughs> that window, it destroys everything. Nice. It's not just like a private browsing session. It is a private operating system. And everything that happens in that is destroyed. And I think that's really cool. And it's a level of security that all these things like Cubes is offering that really no other OS has and that. When you say destroyed, are we talking about like when you send it to your recycle bin and empty it? Or are we talking it's about wiped. wiped? It's wiped. What, wiped, wiped. Yeah, it does, oh. it does a full wipe. They have a secure wipe that they nice. do. Nice. There are some documents that you could have like in some, cool. in some like stashed places, mm -hmm. but I don't think the disposable VM supports that. Okay. So here's a couple other things. Obviously, it's based on Zen. USB sticks and device uh, drivers are sandboxed in the unprivileged VM. Okay. Uh, the networking code is, is sandboxed in the uh, networking VM. The Cube's GUI presents applications if they're all running together locally, all seamless. Uh, and uh, they also offer like secure boot processes and things like nice. that. So here you go. So here this is. So let's go to. Uh, let's go. Let's say I, I binge right. And I go over to Apple.com. Right. Oh my I gosh, mean, that, that's porn oh, right there. Oh, and I'm gonna go look at uh, Tim Cook because he's so handsome in that button-up shirt, right? <laughs> and then right. I wake up after my drunk stupor. I'm like, oh my gosh, people might find out that I went to Apple.com. It, when I close that, it it, it it just it just deleted the. It's VM. gone. Yeah. You, so now you, we, you were never there as far as this. Right. Is if, we, if we go back in there, obviously it's just a it's like a fresh browser all wow. over. Wow. Uh, so pretty neat, and you can see like for some like secure environments, you could really have like a use, and I like it too. Like I could have one could be my personal Firefox, mm. which is persistent, right? And then I could have my work Firefox is maybe logged into all of my work accounts. Instead I mean, of I'll tell you for, some, for someone that's like maybe you live in a country to where you feel a little things are a little unrest, you know, and there are certainly a lot of countries out there yeah, that like fall into that category, yeah, like America, um, but also other countries that are dealing with uh, you know various unrest like in the streets, like really yeah. actively. I mean, we're pretty much couch potatoes here. <laughs> but, you know, but but as far as other countries hey, actually uh, like go and do things, and yeah, are, you yeah, know, making their uh, protests and whatnot. Um, this is a very 
safe way to do it. You know, or you, you know, know, what about like a security researcher who right. has to work with some stuff that could potentially damage a system? Uh, you're working for a corporation. You're working on a top secret, uh, right? Uh, hair. Uh, situation, right? Formula, whatever the hell it is, a and new you're worried about corporate. Cap. Yeah, exactly. And you're worried about corporate espionage. You know, you yeah, you would you could isolate it out like that. Uh, you know, you could interesting. You could have your workspace, your play space. All of that stuff is really easy to do mm -hmm. with it. So uh, because it is because it is based on Zen, right? You also have some other capabilities that you uh, would normally have. Uh, so you hmm. you know you've got your you got your app isolation. That's obvious. Um, which I think I've got some good diagrams in the show notes. If you guys aren't, if you guys are not quite grokking this, you might want to go check that out. They they've done some good illustrations. Uh, but here's the other thing: is because it's based on Zen, you could also run Windows applications seamlessly if you just install a Zen oh, Windows machine. Wow, it's a little bit different. It's not That's quite as para virtualized. Weird. Yeah, so the performance isn't quite as. See, on the Linux side, they're using mm -hmm. para virtualization. Okay, so that means the Linux system is aware it's being virtualized using a nice uniform technology. Okay. Yeah, and it you know it knows it's communicating with mm -hmm. a virtual networking card, so it does a little better. You can you can do full hardware emulation and then run Windows applications seamlessly on the Cube's desktop. Wow. Yeah, and, and again. There's some major limitations to using cubes. This is not the distribution you play Steam on. You know? uh, yeah, I was just about to say, you know, it's like you know, you're using you're using wine. You're embarrassed to tell anybody. Right. You know, you want you don't want anyone to know. You want to wipe that when you reboot. Right. Yeah. This is uh, it's Fedora 20 based, and it, it it is really good at isolating secure environments. It is not so good at being a general casual desktop that you're just Got loading it. software on stuff like that because. So many things are isolated out that it just, I don't know, I just don't, I don't imagine it scaling very well. I used it, I've been using it for about three days as my main desktop, and it actually is quite doable. Right now, when you install it, it uses the Fedora 20 installer. I'm not in love you know, with that. You know, I'll but. tell you, um, if you're traveling, uh, even here in the States, yes. and uh, you're kind of like, you know, it's none of your damn business what's on my laptop. Right. There you go. Uh, right. Put that, throw that on your laptop. You don't care, right? So this, I think, that's is a, nice. This is a that that is such a great point because this is a, like if you're worried about going through the airport yeah. and maybe you've downloaded like a, you know Inspire magazine or a, what was that a, you know the, some bomb cookbook just for for your own. Oh yeah, fun. You, you know yeah you're you're reading anarchist cookbook yeah, to that, relive yeah. your youth or whatever. Right. You know, uh, which who hasn't not, read that? I mean, this would be the operating system yeah. where you could feel a little bit safer doing that because yeah. not only not only are they doing all the isolation, they're doing the, they're doing cryptograph cryptograph. Uh, they're doing like cryptographic signing on some of the exactly. files too, so they can you have like security there too, so you know things haven't been altered. So it's a good safe system. You know if somebody's been screwing or bugging with it. Exactly. And the desktop, the main desktop itself, is running natively. This here is performing great. You know, I, I have uh, I have an, an Intel 4600 in this machine, and you can see KWin is is fully mm -hmm. accelerated. So you do get a fully functional KDE desktop or an XFCE desktop, depending on which one nice. you choose. And then you just have if you like to segment out various aspects of your life, I think this will work very well. If like your work is all contained in one browser and your your play life is in another browser yeah. this would work really well for you so here's the here's an important question let's say they'll go back to the whole airport scenario is this something you can run on USB probably I would imagine it's probably a little much for yeah, the, I mean it's uh, supposed USB to be a big USB stick yeah. and it was 3.0 you probably want to be USB yeah. 3.0 and you kind of defeat the purpose because your old hard drive is still in there and yeah. everything's still you, you really kind of lose your value there so yeah. really you're better off just going dedicated just yeah I, I uh, that's a tough one that's yeah it sure is a really neat concept though and I I, I think part of it what really impresses me is the way they've managed to isolate out, um, you know, the networking stack and and the disk stack, and then all the different applications, like what they call the junk zone, the personal right. zone, the works. I think that's right. so clever. And when you install it, you can choose to have the pre-made um, uh, VMs, or you can just create them as you need them, all based on the Fedora 20 template. I like that. And you just make changes to the Fedora 20 template, and then every machine you create after that uh, will have those settings. So it's pretty neat. Cube's OS. Don't call it a Linux distro, but it's based on Linux. It's pretty awesome, and. I, I think, I think that we just kind of had a stretch of like, um, you know, really kind of unique approaches to Linux. We've talked right. about uh, talked about Core OS, which was uh, awesome, Bedrock, and now uh, mm -hmm. Cubes, and uh, they're all like Linux, like we've never seen before. And they, there's really compelling use cases for each one oh, of definitely. them. I think maybe because I'm no longer such a server guy anymore, I think this might be the one that would resonate with me the most, mm -hmm. especially if I'm like what you mentioned, traveling. Yeah, I mean, or here's another less uh, tinfoil hat scenario. Um, you know, your laptop gets stolen. It can happen, right? You know, you're traveling, you're at a bus station, perhaps yeah, someone yeah. runs off with it. Maybe yeah. you've got important files in that. You don't necessarily want someone to do. If you have that secure offsite somewhere else that you can access later by logging in and it's not on your computer, hey, that's a good thing. Yep, so go check it out. You guys download it and give it a try. I wouldn't necessarily recommend you use it in virtualization yeah. because it is a virtualizer itself. Yeah. This is a bare metal Zen. You you install this, and it's it's running all on Zen, and mm. so um, you, you really kind of need to have it on bare metal hardware. 
So it's not totally easy to try in a virtual machine. People do it, I think. You but could, but it kind of that's fun. like virtualization inception. Yeah. And little little kind of a door and a door there at that yeah, point. Yeah, probably not going to go so good. Yeah. yeah. All right, Matt. That's the Linux Action Show at Look. Wait, what? That's the Linux that, Action Show's Look at Cube OS. With a Q. Cubes OS. Cubes OS. Don't call it a distro. And don't use a C for cubes. It's Q. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Matt, before yes. we get out of here, a couple of little items to touch on. First all of right. all, I want to say Happy Father's Day to all those dads out there. Officially happy honor, honorary yeah, Father's sure. Day to you too, Matt. And, yeah, right. Uh, really, you know, it's uh, it's another year, and yeah. I gotta tell you, I think Father's Day does it always land on Sundays? Are we always doing the show I on Father's so. Day? I think so. Okay, mean, yeah. good to know. I'll keep that in mind. I, I have forward. no idea. It's in my calendar. Hey, I Matt, have no clue. I got something I wanted to point people at. Yes. You ready for this? Yes. Linux Unplugged. Did unplugged. you know? We, did you know we have a Linux Unplugged? Show? We have that show. Yes, that yes. it's unplugged. In fact, we had the uh, developer of Bedrock Linux right. on last week's episode. Good so show. If you enjoyed last week's uh, look at Bedrock Linux, then mm. go catch episode forty-four of Linux Unplugged. Also, while you're over at Jupiter Broadcasting, why not go give a listen? to one of our Tech Talk Today episodes, Monday through Thursday over at JBLive.tv, a daily technology talk show. They're getting better and better. I mean, Thank they're you. really getting awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, you might have a few things you wanted to point people yes. at, too, don't you? Uh, a couple things, actually. Uh, first one would be the Datamation article. I've uh, got another one up. Boom. It is uh, basically just a, a just a fun, friendly uh, app list. You know, things that I use on a day-to-day basis. So 14 some, apps to yeah. boost Ubuntu. Uh, nice. You know, the, t- the title's boosting, you know, my Ubuntu experience, or boosting my distro experience. We, of course, use Ubuntu in the title because... It's like, Hey-o. That's what we do. But, you know, for me, it would be Arch. Getting them clicks. Yeah, getting them clicks. But, uh, you know, it applies to anything. <laughs> Good apps. So check it out. And now maybe something on the lighter side, Matt. How about a little Fez Part 3? We went back and did the Fez thing. And, uh, Man, look know, at that. Look are. at that. Oh, boy. You guys are getting far. Yeah, he... Well, I don't... I can't play Fez for nothing. I, I, I can do okay <laughs> with it, but he, he does pretty well with it. He gets all... Are you the it. color commentary on this one? I am the... Uh, yeah, I do a lot of the... Uh, uh, expletives and the uh, oh oh oh, oh no. he totally bit it oh yeah. I, I love that's your intro yeah funny nice, nice. boy that's that's he's that's, uh, making put it all making out there. random comments and well yeah uh, good time so check it out uh, if you like uh, you want to hear me just go off and scream and curse and whatnot subscribe check it out there you go yeah. and what not enough Linux for you what yeah. you want more Linux Linux yep. Action Show com go put it in your yes, face right. vote up vote down things that make it into this show give your feedback on a story that comes up this is how we take what you say it's like you're committing your patches to our show. And then we go upstream and we pull those down into our show and mash it all up. That's and that right. makes the Linux Action Show. So go over to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Feedback threads for every single episode. Links if you want to submit a runs Linux. If you want to submit a news That's the place item. to do it. You want to get our attention. Thread. Boom. There it is. Linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Also mm. the great, uh, great place to go for Linux Unplugged right. as well. All right, Matt. Well, I think that's everything we had for this week's episode, so I'll leave these guys just with this little bit. I got like a pro tip that only a few people know about. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's take this in here. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and then choose Linux Action Show from the dropdown. Then put in your message, and it sends it off to a team of monkeys that I have curated curated to just the smartest monkeys out there, and they send us your feedback, and we read it on our show. We would love that. And, of course, you can also join us live over at jblive.tv Sunday at a 10 a.m. Don't know what time that is in your time zone? Guess what? we got monkeys that solve that, too. JupiterBroadcasting.com slash calendar will convert that to your local time zone automatically. Boom. Monkey time. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. In the jungle. The mighty jungle. The lion sleeps. Tonight. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah. That'd be the William Shatner verse. <laughs> Mark. One five. Two two one three seven four eight six 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 five one four four three seven. Okay, did it. <laughs> we have entered the Linux Action Show Zone, where we will talk about Linux. It's Cube OS. It's Linux, but not as you know it. You know what? You know what? I used to do not related, but you know how I might, I've probably told you this story. But you know how uh, you used to be able to go to AOL.com and just mm-hmm. order a CD? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember so that. What I used to do is, uh, I don't know, I guess when I was a kid, I didn't have anything better to do. <laughs> right. Is I would um, I would order CDs as, <laughs> as William Shatner. Did you really? Yeah. And then. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, so but I so then and then yeah. I expanded that to start getting other stuff sent as William Shatner. So then my post office people started to actually think. I So they started writing, is this really you on the envelope from the post oh office? Oh, my God. Yeah. That would I would have had fun with that. So, fun so yeah, with they that. thought I was William Shatner, which is great. Oh my, oh boy. Uh, 
I don't think I got any special treatment other than I never seemed to miss any of my mail, which was nice. <laughs>